Good evening. Thanks for being here. My name is Dr. P, and this talk is called College Tours Making the Most Before, During, and After Your Trips. I'm Dominique Paterano, the founder and president of Crimson Coaching, which provides academic tutoring, test prep, and college consulting to students worldwide. And uh, before we go any further, a lot of people ask me sometimes why Crimson Coaching, um, as you can see from uh, the mats of the diploma and uh, photograph behind me, um, they are crimson and that's the color of Harvard, my alma mater, therefore, and I am a coach. So Crimson Coaching. And I developed this talk because this is actually the world premiere of this talk. It's the very first time I'm giving it um, because I really do think that there is so much that families can do before they ever step foot on a campus. And, you know, oftentimes spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars in order to get to the college campus. And there's quite a bit that the student can do after also to increase their chances of admission. So I really want to basically save families time and money and also help students you know, get into the colleges of their dreams more effectively. And that's why I developed this talk. So tonight's agenda, I will be speaking uh, again, I've never given the talk yet, so it should be about 30 to 40 minutes. If you could keep yourself muted during that time, that would be awesome, um, only because I tend to get really distracted, but feel free to throw any questions that you have into the chat during the talk. If I don't get to it immediately, it's just because I'm finishing my thought and I'm middle-aged and I'm worried that I'm going to forget the training of thought, but I will definitely get to your question either in the middle of the talk or all at the end when I will do a Q&A. But before we go any further, I do just want to thank you all for showing up on this Monday, last Monday of January, because I know there's lots of other things that you probably have to do tonight. To thank you also to Kimberly Carletta for inviting me back to give this talk and to Orange Public Library for hosting it. So the doctor and Dr. P comes uh, from my PhD in history. And as a historian, I always like to be very transparent about my sources. So the first source is personal, as uh, uh, on the occasion of my 25th reunion from Harvard University, this has happened to be where I lived, uh, I went to a talk given by William Fitzsimmons, who's the longtime undergraduate uh, admissions director there, and he talked to my class about some, some recent trends, and he also gave us some time-worn tips, so I'm um, passing them along to you as well as professional. So I really started, I was not, I did not get out of college and found Crimson Coaching immediately. I was a teacher at places like Great Neck North High School, Scarsdale High School, closer to Orangeburg, as well as Horace Mann School for four, five years where I taught history. Um, but of course, I started Crimson Coaching in 2014, and I have really gone through the college application process with many students They've gone on um, with uh, under my guidance to get accepted to places like Princeton and Stanford. And, uh, you know, these are just kinds of observations and uh, insights that I've gathered along the way. And last but not least, I do keep abreast of the latest literature in this field. So, for example, in 2020, Jeffrey Salingo came out with Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions. He's the New York Times reporter whose beat is higher ed. And then Ron Lieber, who's actually a personal finance columnist, but came out with the book The Price You Pay for College. And if, especially if, financial aid is something that you will be seeking. I cannot recommend Lieber's book enough. Many of the tips that I'm sharing tonight in particular are from his book. And uh, he just, it, it's just chock full. I could, there's no way I could share everything. So you definitely need to get and read the book if you um, want to find out everything that Lieber had to say. 
So let's talk about, first of all, when is the best age of the student to start touring and why tour colleges in particular? Oops, sorry about that. Um, so I really believe that you should have different goals for your child at different ages. And this represents the ideal. So if you are currently the parent of a junior or senior, don't freak out if you didn't start at in eighth grade. But eighth, ninth, and 10th grade, you can certainly begin to visit colleges and do so really inexpensively by staying local and gathering information about where your child feels most comfortable by going to a variety of different institutions, large, medium, small, uh, public, private, urban, suburban, rural. And we're really lucky in our neck of the woods that we have so many different permutations of all of these different types that um, hopefully by the end of 10th grade, your child will know which permutation is the best for him or her so that that way you can then save money in 11th grade by only visiting the colleges that are right for him or her. Oh, good. And Ms. Carletta just told us that that your Orangeburg Library has the price you pay from uh, for college by Ron Lieber. Yeah, my public library, I'm not there, but they have it too. And they, they had Salingo as well. So they really were um, bestsellers. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and then finally, in 11th grade, once hopefully you've seen a variety and your child knows which permutation is best, then if you are going to spend money on a, perhaps a plane fare and hotel, you're not visiting, for example, really, really tiny schools in California and really, really large schools like, for instance, Harvey Mudd and UCLA. It, it, that would be really inappropriate if you're, a child were applying to both because either they like small schools or they hate them. OK, um, so. I would say if you're at this stage, you really want to start touring your safeties first, then your targets, then your reach schools, because your reach schools are the schools that you really, really want to go to. And if you get in, you know, you would probably go there anyway, but you really need to know, will I be happy at one of my safeties if that's all that I happen to get into? Okay. And the goal at that point is really narrowing the list down to the 12 that you actually will apply to. And then finally, 12th grade, perhaps definitely after the applications are in and perhaps after the acceptances are already in, now the goal is which college will you actually attend? And so you can see for the three different stages of a student's life, in pre-high school and high school, there should be very different goals for the college tour. So what are some things you can do before you go? In the eighth, eighth to 10th grade range, you really just wanna have an open mind as possible because you, know, you have no idea, you might think your child is best for a small school, but they may come alive in a big school. And you may really want them to go to your own alma mater, but it might not be the best fit for your child. So I would say parents and kids just have an open mind as you're in this exploratory phase. And I would say in 11th grade, you really want to have a draft of the college list before you visit. And drafting a college list is really beyond the scope of this talk tonight. We will touch on some of the same things that I talk about in that talk. But if you haven't yet seen that talk of mine, you can certainly go to youtube.com slash C slash Crimson Coaching, and you can get more specific uh, um, tips on how to craft a college list. Because I think once you have that draft list of about two dozen schools, then visiting the colleges becomes much more informative. Sorry about that. And then finally, um, 
if you're in 12th grade and you haven't done any of the things that we're going, so that after this slide, it's really for 11th and 12th graders. And if you have, if you're in 12th grade and you haven't done those things yet, fear not, just start doing them now. So imagine we are in 11th grade and we have a draft list. What research should we do before we go? So a lot of this comes from Lieber. Lieber recommends reading the chancellor's and president or president's pages and the college's strategic plans to get an idea of the values of that school. And I might even say that should be something that should inform the making of the draft as well. But I definitely recommend take an official online tour that's offered by the university as well as unofficial tours that you can find on Live Campus, which is a company that does this, as well as um, College Scoops. I know the founder of that company. Um, she uh, marshals kids at those schools to host little videos. And then I ha actually have not been on TikTok or Instagram, but I would be shocked if there were not other videos on those two platforms of kids at those schools as well, because clearly the unofficial tours are going to give you a very different idea about the college than the official tours. And I will tell you, I mean, thank goodness Omicron is really waning now, but um, there was an article in the in Insider High, Higher Ed, which is kind of about higher ed. It's free. I'll mention it later on, and you can sign up for that uh, as well. Um, that was talking about college tour restrictions being imposed once again because of Omicron. Um, for those of you who are dealing with just your first child attending college right now, you might not know that in the week uh, when COVID-19 first happened, I mean, in 2020, colleges were shut down to outsiders while they were still in session. Of course, many then sent the students home as well. But when the tour when when the classes were still in session they weren't letting tours go on and so that's really when those official tours online started becoming a much more robust part of the websites that uh, the colleges put out. And so I would say that's sort of a silver lining to all this is before the uh, before COVID the online tours were, you know, some colleges had them they weren't all always great. Now they're, they're, you know, quite good, but of course the unofficial ones will also give you another side. Um, you might also want to consider lists that are important to you. So for example, Fortune has a list of colleges where you can make the most money. Money has a list of colleges that are the best deal, uh, US News and World Report. Again, all these um, different lists um, might tell you different things about a college. And I, can, I also have a handout, which I'm gonna mention several, night, uh, several times during tonight's talk. Feel free to email me um, that I have that list of the lists on that handout. You also want to follow the school's online student newspapers just to get a sense of what that campus is like. Set up a Google News alert for the colleges that are on your list. All of these things, I think, will also go into creating the draft, but they also may help knock whittle that down. Um, maybe you find out something that you don't particularly like, uh, and now that college might be off the list. Again, you can set up um, uh, an account on Inside Higher Ed. And I think I get articles every couple of days from, from that. And you can, you can control how often they send you articles. And this is just great for knowing sort of what's going on in, and you know, your kids' colleges might be on in, in an article there. And your two goals for this preliminary online research really should be to start whittling that draft list down and also to begin developing a set of questions to ask while you're on campus itself, okay? So 
this is a question that lots of people would, would ask. We are going to need merit aid, which means scholarship, not tied to our income. What extra research should we do before we go? Well, visit the college's financial aid pages. Try to figure out, is the aid there given need blind? Meaning, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not taking into account how your ability to pay when they when the admissions uh, comes up, uh, the you know they're deciding whether to let you in or not. And if it is need blind, well, what percentage of student need is met? Because sometimes, even if they say they're need blind, they're not actually pledging to give you meet a hundred percent of that need. So then you're left with this gap that you need to somehow fill in. Okay. Um, you also want to find, and this is really difficult. Liebert in his book talks about how difficult it is to find these things because a lot, most colleges are not transparent at all on their website. So you really kind of need to be like Lieber himself, who's sort of a, a dog with a bone about um, finding these these. Um, pages on the website and kind of holding them accountable, the college is accountable for this information. But you want to find the college's net price calculator, which really will help you figure out, I mean, nobody pays the sticker price of, of a college or very, very few people pay that sticker price of what they say tuition, room and board and fees cost. So the net price calculator will start, you'll start to begin to figure out how much it's actually going to cost. The other piece of information that you can get is called the part of the common data set. And what you could do is Google College X, you know, so say you're applying to, I don't know, SUNY Binghamton, and then put in SUNY Binghamton common data set, and a page on that website, but like buried deep within that website will come up that will show the percentage of students who get merit aid, the percentage of students who don't, um, and the retention data of the, the, the college. If your kid drops out, that is a very expensive year for you, okay? So the higher the retention percentages, the more likely it is that your child too will stick in school and get their degree, meaning that those years paid off for something. Um, there are also a whole bunch of nonprofit websites that are really either using crowdsourcing or other ways to figure out how much colleges actually cost. And once again, I've listed them on this little handout that I've prepared for you. If we were in person, I would give it to you uh, on a piece of paper, but um, I have it prepared in PDF form. So feel free to just do that. So what if you're at the point where you're making hotel and travel plans? What should we do now, right? This is a lot of people. I just talked to a gentleman earlier today who is taking his son uh, over February and April break. So these are some things that you should be thinking about. First of all, is the college in session? You want to try to avoid weekends because you're not going to really get a flavor for what it's like in session. Final exams, students are going to be hunkered down studying if that's what they do at the, that school. Uh, and you might not be able to talk to a lot of them. And I know that lots of people take college trips during the summer and it's usually much easier for families to do it. But you don't really get a sense of what your child's life will be like because, first of all, um, so take my alma mater. Harvard is packed with people um, who don't usually go to Harvard uh, taking summer classes there. So it's not a great time to see what the campus is actually like. Um, so you really wanna go when the college is in session. I know that it might not be very cost effective, but try to visit just one college a day. Um, 
it's very overwhelming, this process. And if you try to squeeze one in the morning, one in the afternoon, inevitably, you're not only going to shortchange your time at both, the details might start to run into one another. It's too much information to take in at one time. OK, you definitely want to make sure that you book a tour with the admissions office, because especially with COVID, you know, you can't just show up off the street and go, I'd like a tour. You need to book these in advance. So make sure you do that. Try to get a dorm stay for your child. Again, with Omicron, they might not be doing this, but maybe by the time you go, um, maybe in April, if you're going, that might be more viable staying Overnight gives the kids such a better impression of what it's actually like to go there. And then I would really recommend that your child reach out to faculty members that um, they might be interested in, in, at least in that major, who's who are teaching classes on the day that you're going to be there. See if they could go to a class in that. See, the teach uh, oftentimes faculty will even agree to meet for five or ten minutes. If your child is playing sports, also try to contact coaches to arrange at least a, a, a face to face for a few minutes so that, um, you know, your child can really demonstrate interest beyond just signing up for the tour. And then finally, if financial aid is something that you'll need. Make sure you get an appointment to speak with a financial aid officer and definitely go in with all those questions that hopefully your due diligence uh, uh, came up with. So it's the night before you're leaving. What should you be doing or packing? I would definitely confirm all of your uh, visits. People, you know, especially these days, there's lots of people out sick. Make sure that everybody's able to meet with you. Uh, I also like the spreadsheet to record notes, especially if you're seeing multiple colleges over the course of that week so that you can store your notes and possibly even photos. Um, I have one. I'd be happy to um, share a copy with you. And of course, remember to bring your phone and or camera as well as hopefully a portable charger, um, as well as any questions that you develop from your preliminary research. And students, I would say, look, you don't need to, to wear uh, a suit, either female or male suit, but you do need to dress appropriately, especially, you know, maybe khakis if you're a guy, uh, you know, try not to wear like ripped jeans or anything. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to wear a skirt if you're um, a girl, but make sure your, your clothes are neat, clean, pressed. Uh, and also consider the weather. Um, I actually still, I'm very proud of this. I still have the sweatpants that I bought in 1988 on my trip to Cambridge, Massachusetts, because uh, I was from New York and did not realize that how much colder it would be there and only had a mini skirt on and needed to, uh, it was much colder up in Cambridge. Um, so um, make sure that you are aware of what the weather is like too, okay? So the big day is there. You're finally on campus. What should you do now? Well, definitely take lots and lots of pictures. Um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And in this case, it really is. So um, you want to do that. Also, take a look at bulletin boards, kiosks, grab a student newspaper, especially if you haven't started following it online, just to get a sense of the, the campus culture. Try to just talk to random students, not just the student guide. Many of the student guides, they're wonderful, but they're also often paid by the university. And so the, again, they're going to give you a official um, view and they're being they're taking you to certain places and not others, okay? Um, and to that end, also think about what they're showing you and what they're not showing you. And um, 
you know, Lieber again makes a point of saying, you know, uh, I think at Bowdoin, the tour stops at the mental health center on campus. Whereas at High Point University, um, there was, uh, a, you know, a golf cart tour uh, and he never even saw the library there. So that's telling you what kinds of things, uh, what the student experience might be like by what kinds of things they're showing and not showing. Again, some of this might be curtailed because of COVID, but if you can, go inside a dorm room, attend a class, and buy extra facilities. I mean, the gym or the practice fields, uh, the music studios, the theater studio, whatever you're into, go visit those extracurricular facilities. Definitely make sure the admissions office knows you're there. Get a name and an email address, and you'll see why in a moment. And also, same for financial aid. So you're now totally exhausted. You're in the hotel room that night, or maybe you're back at home. What should you do now? Well, I think first you should relax, and then you should take notes. And the reason, especially if you're seeing multiple colleges throughout the week, I know it's a pain in the neck and it shouldn't be work, but it is a little bit and it should pay off. Take down the notes before you see the next one, because then everything's going to get all jumbled in your mind if you wait to the plane ride back home. OK, um, record your general impressions, but also think about was now with hindsight of a couple of hours, maybe I came up with some follow up questions. Oops. Finally, send thank you emails, at least. I'm a big believer in the handwritten note, but I know I'm super old school. At the very least, you should send a thank you email to everybody whom you met. You could do this on the plane ride home if you have Wi-Fi or at least within one week of your visit. Um, include any of those follow-up questions and tell them how much you enjoyed the visit and how much you would like to attend if that is indeed the case. So after, it's anywhere between one and 12 months after your visit, right? So say if you are, you know, a junior right now and, um, you know, what should you be doing until you apply and even until this time next year after you've applied? You really want to keep in contact with every single person you made, maybe about every six to eight weeks. And a lot of times students say, well, what the heck should I tell this professor? Well, did you publish a chemistry paper in a journal geared for high school students? That's a big deal. And you should share that good news with the chemistry professor you met on campus. Were you elected captain of the volleyball team? Then let the coaches, the college's volleyball coach know if you're going to play, okay? If you don't have any, you know, groundbreaking news like this, okay, fine. But I would definitely just drop them a line to say hello and how much you still like the university every three months because it is very likely that they may forget you. Um, and I think that it just goes uh, a, a long way um, in the acceptance process to reiterating your interest. And during this time, the one to 12 months after your visit, assuming you're a junior now, you're gonna be refining your college list to three reaches, five targets, and four safeties. And some of that whittling down from about two dozen to one dozen will come from those college visits. So you really want to think about those notes that you took and say, mm, you know what, I wasn't crazy about, um, you know, the, the lack of, say, buzz on campus or, you know, um, I didn't like the fact that it was really out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, I felt very isolated. Whatever it is, this is also the time that you should be crossing some of those um, um, uh, colleges off your list. Now, um, 
this may seem very early to some people. Um, and if you are a senior, I don't want you to despair, okay? But I do want the sophomores and juniors in the audience to think about trying to be done with this process by the end of junior year. And, and also, by the way, to be done with your SAT and ACT um, by the end of your junior year. Uh, and to that end, I will just say, um, and I'll share this information at the end as well. Um, I happen to have an, AC, uh, an SAT course, sorry, online that's starting next week for both sophomores who are at least in integrated algebra two or and juniors uh and it is uh it runs for 11 weeks and will prepare you to take the may 7th and june 4th sat and it's such a good idea to be done with this by then because of this recent trend and this is actually from uh jeff salingo's newsletter his monthly newsletter called next and this is just a couple of weeks ago. These these were came out. This is the per, for the, these colleges, Barnard, Tulane, Dartmouth, Rice, et cetera, that fill their classes through early decision. So more than half of their freshman class at Barnard, Tulane, Dartmouth, Penn, Emory, and Duke, more than half of their freshman class was filled through early uh, decision. So that means that you need to be ready to send all your stuff by November 1st. This is a trend that started, I mean, it, it's always been there, but it really accelerated during COVID. We saw it last fall and we see it again this fall. And more and more students are applying early and taking advantage of the the generally the bump the little bit of bump that they get uh, and by the way is in the crafting a college list um, uh, talk that I give I talk about this a little bit more in depth but because there are now more girls that go to post secondary education than boys the bump the early bump is even greater for girls um, so that means you got to be ready really because over the summer you need to be working on that application, okay? So I think it's better to be aware of these things than to be caught unaware of them. And I don't say this to scare you, but rather to inform you so that you can then make informed decisions about your campus tours over the spring. So my final thoughts before we go to questions, uh, basically, that with planning, the journey to college can be exciting, fun, and filled with meaningful experiences during which teens learn more about themselves and the kind of results they want to become. And I know a lot of this seems very overwhelming, but I think by starting early, you can absolutely really help your child kind of find themselves and who they want to be during this process. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, I give webinars about once a week. Feel free to sign up for my newsletter at crimsoncoaching.com. And once per month, you'll get a newsletter that has a little article about this process, as well as um, my upcoming talks for the month. As I mentioned before, you can email me to get my my tips for college tours and on that handout I have all those lists that I mentioned and those websites. Um, if you like Crimson Coaching on Facebook, I often but not always um, will have a little preview video. Um, uh, so that might be a reminder too. And if you do go to my YouTube, I would be so grateful if you um, learned anything here tonight, if you could subscribe because subscriptions, the way the algorithm works, helps the channel to grow and to find more people. So that's really all I have for you tonight. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I already see one person um, a lot, or oh, maybe they're back. Um, but um, please feel free to either throw them into the chat or to unmute yourself. Um, we 
have only a few people. So you could definitely, I, I like to hear voices as well. So feel free to do that. Uh, and while you're thinking about them, I do just want to make sure that I say once again, thank you for coming to Kim Cardletta for inviting me and to Orangeburg Public Library for sponsoring the talk.